Good morning, everyone. Today is 3, 13 February, the year 2003. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of World War II. In conjunction with the Veterans Oral History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum with fellow volunteer, Harry Ziegler, and special guests from Canada and all points uh, here in the United States. Nice to have you folks here. Today, we have the honor and privilege of interviewing Dick Brown. Dick was a TBD devastator pilot aboard the carrier no, Wasp. No, 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 not a pilot, radioman gunner. Radioman gunner. Sorry. <laughs> aboard the carrier Wasp and later part of the ship's company aboard the Yorktown when she was sunk at the Battle of Midway. So nice to have you here, Dick. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're gonna talk to him about that and a lot of other stuff. Now, can you please spell your full name for us? Brown, B-R-O-W-N, Richard, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, middle initial S. And where were you born and what year? In I was born Richard. in 1918, Chicago, Illinois. July 13th. July 13th in Chicago, okay. Um, and what did your dad do? My dad was, uh, was, a sales, was a textile salesman, just like his son. Oh yeah? Uh-huh. Um, how, when did, he, when did he first come to California? I mean to uh, uh, Chicago? I was born in Chicago. No, your, your father. Oh, my father was born in Chicago. Is that right? Well, where did, where did, how did your family end up in Chicago? Where did they originally come from? Well, interesting enough, if, if it's too late now to see, but uh, my grandchildren are sixth generation Americans. My great grand grandfather was in the posse that had a down, Billy the Kid, and uh, his guns were just on exhibit at the uh, Gene Autry Museum in Los Angeles, and I went down and saw them and he, when he tracked with the posse from 1880 to 1881. So, and my grandfather was born in a wonderful town called, uh, oh God, so what happens when you get to be? Wagon Wheel Gap, Colorado. Oh, wagon wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so did they catch uh, Old Bill? Oh, I don't know. Oh. That part of it is lost <laughs> in history. Pat Garrett was, uh, apparently yeah. was the guy. Yeah, that I, one was an ivory handled and one, one was regular. Yeah. But we saw them, and it was oh. it was not always wonderful. <laughs> I guess, yeah. And your mom, what was her uh, name and her maiden name? Her, her maiden name was Sells, S-E-L-Z, and her family was in the shoe business. It was called Sells Shoe Company out of Chicago. And uh, how did her family end up in Chicago? Where did they all come from? Or did you know? Her father came from Germany as a young man, and uh, his wife was born in New York City, but was taken back to Germany for education. So. Yeah. And how did you spell her last name? S-E-L-Z. S-E-L-Z, okay. Uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have one brother, Edwin Jr., Ned, better known as Ned. And he served in the Army also. And how, was he older or younger than Younger, you? he's five years younger than I am. Okay. Um, and I guess you kind of grew up during the Depression. Oh, yes. Tell me what that was like. Well, I'll tell you the truth. We own the, the apartment built. My dad and his brother owned the apartment building that we lived in, and it was taken over by the city because of, you know, they couldn't pay the taxes. But we lived there with seven rooms with two baths, and we lived there for, for years paying a very minimum amount because nobody could afford to, to pick up the back, back taxes. And uh, I lived across the street from a playground and I don't remember other than a big car to a small car and a few of the other things, but I don't remember the Depression as being devastating. The, you know, I, I still played baseball, I played, you know, I did all the things we, we always did, but on a lesser state. Yeah. And your dad was able to, to work during the Depression? Well, he did, yes, yeah, he could, yeah. Yeah, he's. And, and what did you say he uh, was in textiles? Textiles. In what capacity? He was a salesman on the road, and I worked for the same firm. I've been with the same firm for 55 years. I'm still working. <laughs> Not much, so, but I'm still working. Okay. Um, so where did you go to uh, grade school, and where did you go to high school? I went to Swift <coughs> School 
which was directly across the street from where I lived. Uh, I went to uh, Sullivan Junior High School and was the one and only junior high graduation class at that school. And then I went on to Sen High School and I graduated in 1936. What was the name of the high school? Sen, S-E-N-N. Okay. Did you play sports in school? Yes, I played basketball and I was on the apparatus team and uh, baseball. What did you do on the apparatus team? Well, what, 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 what did that, what was that? I did horizontal bars, parallel bars, uh, rings, flying rings. You had to have strong shoulders and arms well, to do that, didn't you? And in fact, I was in a trapeze troupe with the, the guy that you know as, uh, as the Lone Ranger. Clayton Moore? Yeah, he, Clayton Moore. Well, his name was Jack Moore when we went to school. Oh, really? And we were in a troop called the Flying Burrs, B-E-H-R-S. We were the youngest, uh, we, we were amateurs. We were the youngest trapeze troop, supposedly, in the world. Do you have a net? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And uh, then Jack went on, of course, to become the Lone, Lone Ranger. Ranger yeah. He became a, first a model for the Arrow Shirt Company, and that brought him into, into the Lone Ranger role, I guess, yeah. for television. And do you know why he changed his name to Clayton? Where that? Well, Clayton probably was his middle name. His folks were very very middle class, you know, well-off people. His father was in the uh, real estate business. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did you have any contact with yeah, him so after I you became the I, Lone I, Ranger? I, my, my kids have heard this story. <laughs> and finally, one day, when he came to Minneapolis for some reason, he went into business with his brother-in-law. They called themselves, they called themselves the Ranger Realty Company. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and it was right up was in the papers. So I immediately called and uh, I talked to his brother-in-law, and I gave him the background, the Sen, and all the years with the flying birds and all that stuff. He said, oh yeah, you got the right one. So I said, uh, he said, he'll call you back, he's out showing a house. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to my oldest daughter, if the Lone Ranger calls, <laughs> tell him I'll call him back because I got to do something. So my daughter said to me, you know, I think you're nuts, Dad. <laughs> So when we got back from where we were, she said to me, listen, I got to tell you, the Lone Ranger called. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the kids over there. But I got to tell you, he show business. I was a textile salesman. You can't go back. We talked about where so-and-so was and who was still alive. And, and he said, how come you didn't look me up sooner? And I said, how the hell would I know that Clayton Moore and Jack Moore were the same guy? Couldn't you tell by my voice? I said, Jack, I left town in 39. <laughs> well, how could I remember? <laughs> um, th that trapeze act was that with like a circus or, or, or how? Yeah, we did. The, we did the, uh, you know, just just the little benefits. We worked with Barnum and Bailey, you know, but we were billed just as amateurs. We did. We didn't get paid for it. It was a thrill. Oh, we worked. The, we worked uh, uh, the World's Fair. Oh, you Chicago know. World's Fair. Yeah, thirty-nine. Yeah, thirty-nine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what were some of the the uh, tricks or no no uh, no no big tricks. <laughs> I wouldn't get up on one of those things again. <laughs> and it, well, you know, we were lucky. He was a catcher now because he was the big guy. Okay. He was a good-looking big guy. I can tell you that compared to us, I probably weighed so a hundred pounds. You know. Yeah. So there would be like plat high oh, platforms. Yeah. You'd be on one, you'd yeah. be on another, and you would like swing, swing over. Down. And you know, if I did a if I did a full somersault, that was a big thing. And would he come off the platform? Oh, would he would. He was a catcher. But where would the catcher be? So he was already on there. With, on know. the platform. No, no, he was on the. He was on the trapeze. Oh, he was on. He, he was okay. On he was trapeze. swinging back yeah. and forth, yeah. and then you would. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And what percentage of misses did you have? Well, the last one I missed, I busted my wrist. My father said to me, "That's it. <laughs> <laughs> You're through." <laughs> So what year did you graduate from high school? 36. In 1936. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what did you do then? Uh, let me see, I gotta think for a minute. I went to work. Oh, I, I remember, I, you know, this is a funny story. He said, my dad said, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, I wanna be a, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to be a physical education teacher. And now we're talking about hard times. You know, my dad was lucky if he made a living. And he looked at me and he said to me, I should send you four years to high school to be a gym teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but if I wanted to have been a lawyer or a doctor, I would have been different. But a gym teacher, you know. To go four years to college, he wasn't yeah, going to. Yeah, he wasn't going to. So we compromised that. and I went to work. Okay. 
for him? <laughs> you went to work for him? For your dad? I went to work for the textile. For the textile, yeah. yeah. And in what capacity? Well, first I was a, you know, I, I am, I, 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 you know, I boxed up textiles, I unboxed textiles and put them in the shells. I cut them up when they were needed and uh, delivered them. And then I eventually worked up to a, uh, to a salesman and I've been a salesman. Well, they sent me up to Minneapolis from Chicago in 51 to run the office. And I'm still there. So where would they get their, so their textile? Did they make the? Or no, we were called, well, they were called converters. Mills would make, make the goods and we would buy them. And we would sell the smaller accounts, the, the big mills only wanted big customers, but there were a lot of small people who, who couldn't buy the quantities, and that's where converters came in. Tell me what you were, well, when did you, uh, when did you join the service? Or tell me what you did on, if you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1940. Well, I had the duty of the weekend of December 7th. I was at Norfolk, Virginia. So you were already in the Navy. Oh, okay, oh, let's I, back up and, yeah. and tell me how you got into the Navy, into well, the service. I got a uh, I got a letter from the Navy Department. <laughs> Get a letter from the Navy Department, saying because I had held a joint license as a Boy Scout in radio, that they were looking for experienced personnel, and that if you would enlist, you would go to three years to uh, three months to radio school, and then you would graduate as a. They, as they put it, as a petty officer, third class. Well, boy, that sounded terrific. Yeah. So my dad said to me, listen, you know, the war is coming sure in heck. And he said, maybe you're better off to, to pick your own spot rather than have somebody pick it for you. And until this day, I'm thinking that my dad maybe was trying to get rid of me. <laughs> but anyway. That would have been what year then? 39. 1939. 39. And had you uh, been really interested in radio? And Hadn't stuff? touched it since I left the Boy Scouts. But I mean, at that time, did you? Were you interested in radio? No, no, no. no. It's, it's something to do. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, uh, yeah. I was, uh, I went to, I enlisted, and, the, and it was a special the uh, enlistment, and I was to do three months at school, and if you graduated, then you would do another nine months at sea, or wherever they put you, yeah. and. Uh, then you were out. Well, that was terrific. <laughs> Didn't work out quite that way. Didn't work out quite that way. I graduated. And, uh, and where did you go to uh, your first? Uh, in, uh, radio school was at Indianapolis, Indianapolis, Indiana. Right. At the uh, Naval Reserve Armory. There were about 400 people, I suppose. Yeah. And there were four. I always tell the story. There were four of us that were fairly, fairly friendly, friendlier than anybody else. There was a call from the fleet. I guess they needed radio, and I never knew, knew why. Yeah. But one guy from Cleveland, one guy from Detroit, were sent out, on, and they went aboard the Arizona. Oh. And uh, I went to New York Town, and the other guy went to a heavy cruiser, which was also bombed. So we didn't. The four of us didn't do too well. <laughs> but I still have the pictures because I've been back to Hawaii a couple of times, and I've been aboard the Arizona, and I took pictures of their names and I've got them at home. Yeah. So, okay, where were you on December 7th then? December 7th, we were in Norfolk, Virginia, Pier 7. I had the duty that weekend. And you were on which ship? The Yorktown. The Yorktown. Yeah, then. yeah. Prior to that, I was on the Wasp and we were doing North Atlantic Patrol and so forth. Okay, that's know. when you were on yeah. the Wasp. Yeah. But the weekend of December 7th, I was on the uh, Yorktown at Pier 7 in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we were going to, we were supposed to go into Portsmouth for a complete overhaul, so there was a leave party already gone. The first leave party was gone, I was in the second. And uh, I got through with my watch with that other guy. We went over at, at, to the, what we called the jib joint, and I bought presents, you know, in order to take home with me for the second, you know, when I was going to go out and leave. When I came back aboard ship, somebody said to me, hey, Brownie, What's this about the, about the Japs bombing Pearl Harbor? And I said, you're nuts. I just got off a watch. I didn't hear anything about it. And I don't think I got it out of my mouth when all of a sudden it said, now hear this. 
The Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. The ship is now operating under a state of war. All radio men report back to the, uh, to the radio shack. Well, we set up, first of all, we listened to CBS and NBC and uh, anybody that, that we could, because everybody had friends, you know that. And uh, then we set up landlines to send out recall telegrams to the Western Union. And I will say this, that to the credit, most people that were on leave came back voluntarily. They didn't wait, uh, they, you know, they, they did, a telegram didn't make them return. They came back on their own. And needless to say, I never got to leave because we had only 50 caliber machine guns, but 20 millimeters were just out. So there was a crew that came in from General Motors and we cleaned up and did whatever we had to. And then we went down through the canal and the people from General Motors were back, were uh, stationing uh, 20 millimeter guns at every spot that they could. And we left them, we dropped them off. We went through the canal and dropped them off at uh, San Diego. And uh, so that you were on your way to Pearl then? Or? Well, what happened was we picked up a load of Marines and I talked to you about it earlier. Can't remember the name of the island. They didn't know whether it was going to go Free French or Vichy French. So we took the Marines, and that was going to be the first invasion. But happily, uh, they went, the island went Free French, and we dropped the Marines off, and that was probably the first expeditionary force for us on the war. And so then where did you go from there? Well, we went down to, through the Marshall and Gilbert, and I believe that we fired the first shots it was the Yorktown and the Enterprise. And uh, the Enterprise got hit. And we went out of a place called Tonga Dabu in the Tonga Group. And the Queen was, was uh, English educated, and she was a big woman. But she was also a smart woman. And so we had shore leave. But the, she took every woman, every girl, up to the mountains. There wasn't anybody in town <laughs> except men. <laughs> and, <so laughs> and, uh, the bummer. Yeah. And uh, then we went back to, uh, to Pearl. You know, it gets hazy. You know, yeah. we're talking about 60, 65 years ago, and it's begins to fade out. All right. And do you remember? When you first went into Pearl, did you see all the devastation? Well, I got to tell you, we were in a Pearl three weeks. Three weeks later, I think, after seven, and Buckmaster, who was the captain, uh, made us all had a stand in formation in dress clothes. No, like no dungarees. Everybody had to get into dress whites, and we came down through the canal through the, through the entrance. And I want to tell you something. Three weeks later, the devastation was just. Tremendous. I mean, many of us cried, and uh, that was it. And then, so then, you went out on patrol. Then after that, probably. Yeah. yeah. And we went on patrol. And, and we you picked. Okay. Yeah. Just hopefully, over. And I think we picked up with the. This is where it gets a little hazy. Then we picked up with the. With the uh, Lexington. Yes. And I think we went on down. And that's when the Battle of the Coral we'll Sea see. was fought. And you'll see it was we go downstairs, go down below, and I'll show you, you know, on the map over, over the Owen Stanley Range. And uh, right, yeah. Because they, they were getting, the Japanese were trying to get into the northern part of Australia to take over Australia. And the Battle of the Coral Sea changed that. Yeah. They were sending troops down to. Uh, Port Moresby, I yeah, believe. Yeah, Port Moresby and Ley, Salamo and Ley, and, uh, and around. And as I understand it, that's the first naval battle in which ships never saw each other. It was airplanes against your ships. Well, the only thing is, the, other way the Lexington got hit and got hit bad. And I want to tell you, it was on fire. Oh, boy. You could, you could see it from. Oh, sure. We were, we were running around and around, and I kept saying, let's get out of here because it was at night, because it got darker, the fire was worse. But to the, to the Navy's credit, they, they got everybody off, and then they sent destroyers in, and we sunk it ourselves. Right. Yeah. Did you take any hits on the York Yes, we were, hit, we were hit very badly through the forward elevator, and uh, yeah, we, we were uh, 
we live back to Pearl. And okay, you're uh, you are a radio operator still. I was a radio man second radio class man at the second. time. And, yeah. which, and so, what was your duty aboard uh, Yorktown at that time? Well, I was part of the ship's company. I had been with Torpedo Five, but then I uh, Torpedo Bombing Seventy Two was okay, but Bombing Five was not a great thing with torpedo planes. Right. When you fly into the torp when you fly into a target, you're coming this way, and they made 180 knots top speed. That's carrying a torpedo. That's one torpedo. Now, when you drop it, you drop it almost at water's height. You're just above the water, and then you almost stand still when you drop it. You know, it's a, you release all that weight, and then you've got to turn, and you're wide open. And uh, most most SV, uh, 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 TBDs did not return. Right. Pilots didn't have any. But by that time, I had been. Uh, I've been assigned to Frank Jack Fletcher's fleet uh, flag, and uh, that was one of the several several radio but he had radiomen, yeomen, singlemen, and then officers. And so, uh, did, were you uh, aboard the planes? Uh, no, I wasn't. You, you, okay, no, so you no, you were on the ship. I was on the ship. Okay, but with Fletcher's flag. Okay, and that's uh, at Coral Sea. Fletcher was. Uh, had well, no, yeah, at Coral Sea, but. Uh, well, I'm talking about. I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm talking about Midway now. Okay, we're getting into. Okay, okay, let's. Okay, so you were able to. You got back to Curl and had uh, some damage that needed to be oh, repaired. Lots of damage, and I, as I recall, and if anyone has seen the movie Midway, I it's probably. It. I thought it was very, very good, and tells you a lot of the history about Midway. And as I recall, was it Halsey? Wasn't he? Um, well, Halsey was the overall. He but he was sick or something. I remember so Task Force 7, I think it was. And, we, and they were yeah. But the Yorktown was hurt really bad. Really and bad. they knew they needed it for Midway and, I mean, for the upcoming battle. And, you know, I, they said, okay, it's going to take us, you know, two months to fix this. And he said, we need it in three days. Right. And somehow or another, they got the thing they underway. Got and they fixed the elevator and they took care of what they had, had to do. And we were supposed to be the backup. The Hornet Enterprise and the Enterprise, they, they they were the main thing. Well, we were the backup. We we were the last out and the first hit. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, first time you were under fire, so to speak. I mean, what were your thoughts? What? Uh, well, let me tell you about that. In harm's way. We yeah. have anybody that's sitting here in the audience that was in combat. I'm sure you'll you'll agree with me. We did so many abandoned ship drills, so many fire drills, so many of this drill, all hours of the day and night. Because when you get under those extreme circumstances, I'm speaking for myself now, and I imagine that it's, you don't think too much because you're scared. But you do everything by rote, what you were taught to do. And I say to this day that I'm alive because I knew the left foot didn't go any, it didn't stop until the right foot moved. I mean, you just, you did everything. And I'm sure, and then there were a lot of brave souls, I'm sure, that uh, that went on to do even bigger and better things. And uh, but I, I say that the training saved, uh, saved many, many, many lives. Yeah, I think these interviews that we do and people that have done extraordinary things, I think they attributed it pretty much to the training they had. Yeah. They just hadn't been in a certain situation at a certain time, yeah. and they like you, they just automatically did whatever needed to be exactly. done, exactly. and exactly. someone else in the same situation could very well have done the same yeah. thing. Now we took the same these, training. We, we, you know, they found us at Midway, and boy, they, they did us up good. And we were listing, I don't know if it was a port side of, anyway, port side of, Anyway, and a Buckmaster, who was Elliot Buckmaster, who was the captain of the Yorktown. Uh, well, I, I don't want to back up a little. When we got hit, when I was with Frank Jack Fletcher, who was the admiral in charge of that operation, and a fellow by the name of Lewis, who was his captain, uh, he said, I can't fight a war from a dead ship because we were dead in the water and on fire. And uh, 
the Louisville came alongside and they transferred over. He didn't take any enlisted men, naturally. <laughs> he took Captain Lewis and himself, a couple of staff officers, and they went aboard the Louisville to, to fight it, to get, for their, to get more orders. And uh, finally, Elliot gave orders to abandon ship, and you drop lifelines in there. Their lines with knots, and I think there's cargo nets, but I went down a lifeline, and I'm sure I had skinned hands because I was going down fast. Uh, and then you come down to, to to a bulge, which is an armored plate to, to, to secure you against torpedo hits, but on carriers, I don't know how. But anyway, you land on that, and then you've got oil in the water that must be a foot foot and a half thick, and I'm a good swimmer, but I, you know, it's tough to make traction when you're in oil, but I want to tell you, oh, and I always say, there's always, there's one thing, I saw a guy, and he said to me, hi, Brownie, how are you, and I said, hi, how are you, and we kept going the opposite way, it was like, it, you know, it's a dream sequence, <laughs> I mean, th th that's how people are, but anyway, finally, I got away from the ship because I was afraid if it capsized, I'd be sucked under and I wanted to get as far as it was, but also, I said, don't get by yourself because the Pacific is a very big ocean to find one little guy like you. So I swam where everybody else was swimming, and uh, a longboat from the USS Walsh, which was a destroyer, was out. Uh, and I caught a life, I caught a life uh, a preserver that they were trailing, and the gunnels were all full, everybody holding on, and I caught that, and I didn't let go. Now, you've got to remember, in a task force or a task group, there's usually four destroyers and a heavy cruiser, so there were other people around, uh, and everybody did their part, so I was taken aboard the USS Walsh, and they took care of our physical needs, and to our amazement, the next morning, New York Town was still floating. It was tipped real bad. So they had arranged for a tug to come out from Pearl. And our destroyer on the USS Hammond went along on the low side. And they called for volunteers, working rates only. That's mechanics and uh, machinist mates and stuff, you know, hard. hard. And they went and the Hammond tied up along the low slide, low side, and she furnished power, and they were going to open up all the things and try to right it. But a, a lone Japanese submarine from a long distance fired a spread of torpedoes, and it hit the Hammond, and the Hammond broke in half, and the depth charges went off, and those poor guys aboard the Yorktown had to re get off again all over. And the Hammond lost a lot of people because those blasts in the water can kill you. And, uh, and then she rolled over and she went down. And did you see that from the ship you were on? You know, I don't remember. I'm going to be truthful. I just remember the hit and I remember the. Uh, now, backing up a little bit, as I recall, our planes found the Japanese carriers first, and there were four of them, and they s were able to sink three, but the fourth one they didn't get. And that one, I believe, I guess it already had planes heading towards our planes, our, our yeah. ships, and the Yorktown, that's when you got hit so bad. Um, what was it? What's it like being? I mean, there are planes coming. Do you see the Japanese planes? They come real close, and, you, and there's all. Let's just describe. Yeah, well, describe they have what 20, you like. know, People, were, you know, we carry a few five-inch guns, and they're not. They're not much. Uh, you can't. You can't fire them in the air. But the 20 millimeter with their crews. Uh, I mean, you know, we knocked down a few, and uh, the torpedo bombers. Uh, they were always were sitting ducks. I don't care whose side you were at. And, uh, but one went down the stack. The dive, dive bombers. I was, went down the stack and knocked out all the boilers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and there were inside explosions and fires. And uh, people on deck, they called, 
people had served on deck, if my memory is correct, but they were called yellow pearls, and everybody wore a different color. Uh, if, if you're, uh, uh, whatever your rate is, or whatever yeah, duty is. To whatever your duty was, everybody would. And then we had the guys that, that landed you, and uh, they had paddles. And they would say, you gotta straighten out, and if they didn't like it, they'd give you this, and and when you landed, you had hooks on the back. Uh, and those hooks caught a pneumatic wire. And it was a very gentle thing, you know, it wasn't, it didn't jolt you a heck out of you. But if that, if that hook didn't hold, then there was a crash barrier, and you would fly in, a, or go in that crash barrier, and it would hit you just on the lower part of the propeller, and then tip you. And they were wooden, as I recall, they were wooden decks, and they were replaceable. And uh, I want to tell you, the, when the American-made planes were were wonderful planes. Uh, the reason the Jap Japanese Zeros were so good because they were fast, they were maneuverable, but they were just paper mache. Uh, American planes, whether they were the F4F, F5F, 6F, F SBDs, all had an armor around their pilot. They were slower, and they weren't as uh, maneuverable, but boy, you should see them when they came back. They got back. That's why the Japanese couldn't hold a candle to us. They took care of their pilots. And it's self-sealing gas tanks, too. Self-sealing gas tanks, which the Japanese didn't have. Right, yeah. And I gotta tell you, folks, gotta hand it to naval pilots. They got strapped in their legs their navigation equipment, and when you go on a when you go on a uh, on a raid, and you do it all, and you've got to come back, and it's called point option, and you're looking for an aircraft carrier, the sun's in your eyes, the clouds are there, and you say, where the hell is it? You're in the middle of the Pacific, but those pilots, they got to fly a plane, and they got to be able to do their own navigation off of that thing on the. Th and the, the radio man sitting in the second seat, he's just praying, where is that tank? And then all of a sudden you see a little postage stamp down there, and that's the carrier. And it's a wonderful sight. <laughs> <laughs> I want to back up the uh, Battle of Coral Sea. It seems like I remember hearing that it's dusk, just about dark, or maybe a little bit after dark, and there are some Japanese zeros that are coming in to try and land on one of our carriers. That's our. Was that yours? Yeah, they land. <laughs> That they started, and they they found out the last minute, and they just banked and went off. Of, we, we didn't know what was going on. That's right. I <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so when you were under uh, in the at Midway, what was your duty while you guys were under fire yourself? What were what were you doing? Well, I was already on the. Fletcher, up, up okay, so, conning, so yeah. but what were you doing? What were you doing? Well, we have what they call a TBS, talk between ships. Okay. That's stuff you couldn't hear. You couldn't use regular radio frequency because they were thinking up a TBS was super high frequency, and you could talk. And you know, he was giving orders to do this and do that, and. Uh, and you had to run the dials and. Well, there wasn't any, there was that many dials, done. but uh, then you had signalmen who used the flags, you know, A, B, C, D, you know, and the. Uh, Did you do that too? No, I didn't do signal. No, that was another rate. Okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, Yorktown goes down, and you're on the. Oh, I'm in the water about three hours, three to four hours. Did you have a, a life preserver? Oh yeah. Uh, oh, we all had. When, when you went to battle stations, you had to put on you know, life preservers. You know, the did, stuff. Did those things get water soaked after a while, or tell you the tell truth, I don't remember. I don't remember. Did you swallow a lot of oil? Probably, and stuff? yeah. I got, oh, sure, I was sick. Uh, sick, and I always thought I must have been very cold because I shook for a long time, but I remember as I got older, you know, I wasn't that cold, I was that scared. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, sh the rescue ship that you're on now is the USS Walsh. And that's a destroyer? That's a destroyer. Okay. And then the Fulton came out. Well, I meant to ask you also. Were the seas pretty high or fairly calm, or, or when you were? No, in the they were they were fairly calm. Uh, 
my, my problem was I, you know, there were some explosions and I had water from the explosion, you know, came out through my rectum and, uh, you know, and I bled in a few places that I shouldn't, <laughs> that I wouldn't want to bleed any, anymore. Yeah. But uh, and then the Fulton came out and we were transferred by, transferred by those coal hops, breaches boys, I think they're called, I'm not sure. You know, you get two ships running along together and you send these things over there and you get in these bags, two to a person, and there's nothing between you and then if the ship goes this way or this way, you you know, you go up this way, or if they get closer together, you go down this way. <laughs> and uh, they transferred everybody over, well, as many as they could to the Fulton. Now you get aboard the Fulton, which was a uh, machinist ship, floating machine shop. And from the top from the, to the bottom, it's open. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I want to be on this thing for, you know? <laughs> but anyway, that it, that took us into, into Pearl. And then we were taken someplace at a, for Carlson's Raiders, where I think one of the Roosevelt boys was, was, mm -hmm. was one of the uh, officers. The Marine so, Raiders, yeah. Yeah, the Marine Raiders. And it was a secret camp. They didn't want anybody talking to anybody. Although I know a few guys who said that they, they managed to get the town. I wasn't one of them. Uh, and then I was transferred over to a, to a hospital with Pearl. And afterwards, I was sent back to the States and I went to the hospital at Oakdale Naval Hospital in Oakland, California. And then I got discharged and I went to Mare Island where I went into general detail and I was assigned to, <laughs> to, a, to the AM 155. That's a 180 foot mine sweep, sea going mine sweep. I'd never been on anything smaller than carriers in my entire life. But I was the ranking enlisted man, and uh, I spent some good duty. In fact, I met my first wife there, and we married. We had two children. We were married for nine years. Oh. So at Mare Island is where you met her. No, no, I met her. In oh, oh, I was. I'm sorry. I should back that. I was sent up to to uh, well, I'm an Iron and Steel in Portland, Oregon, where they were building these 180 foot sea going mine sweeps. It was mine dip 29, uh, squadron 10. I'm not too sure. I'm still a member of that group too. <laughs> and, and what was your wife's, uh, what was her name? My, my name was Charlotte Mosler and we were married 49 years. And you had two children did you say? And what were their names? Uh, Merrily and Roberta. And do they live, uh, where do they live now? Uh, both of them live in Minneapolis. Okay, so now you're still on the minesweeper? Yep. And mm. where from there did you go? All over the South Pacific. Oh, yeah? You make fraudulent anywhere. Now, there's, there's something interesting. This is an observation on my part because I had to put in radio call signs for, for every ship that was built. You had to enter it. Now, when we got the Kwajalein, you never saw so many ships in your life. And I still say to this day, we won the war because we were smart, we were resolute, and everything else. But we won it also because we could turn out more goods faster than anybody could ever. You never saw a lot of ships like that in your life between, our, between Kwajalein and Eddie Wee Talk. It's, uh, it, was just, it was just like laying a blanket over somebody. I think Yamamoto recognized that early on. Yeah. That if they, and I think that's why that kind of came to a head at Midway, the big battle, because he felt that if the war went on very long, that's exactly what would well, happen. Of course, that was, you know, the, uh, the uh, capable. You uh, came later, and that, and that was Guam and Saipan. Yeah. And, uh, now, aboard the minesweeper, you would go into where the invasions would be to to just w find just once it lay hey, uh -huh. and then the big battle wagons would lay out ahead back of you. You know those big sixteen inch, sixteen inch shells would come over. Sounded like a freight train, you know. But I never we never landed. We just I know, but I mean you would be looking for mines. Oh yeah, you would, you would work in formation. You'd have the lead ship, which was which was uh, you know the dangerous one, and then and you were spread out this way, and you had caravanes that went out and 
had auto, I think automatic knives on it, and if you could, you know, and if you could, uh, if you ran into anything, you could cut. Uh, but we, I, we never had any problems. We never had any. Problems. Okay. Okay. So when you're, so you're cutting like the the mine, it's like a big ball kind of thing. Yeah, right? but it's sucked. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's tethered to something. So you cut that tether so that it'll float away somewhere. Well, no. Or, then somebody fire with a rifle fires at it and explodes it. Oh, I see. When it bobs up. It has little, little knobs like on it. Man, and I think so. Yeah. I tell you the truth. Something like that. Yeah. I, I, I was inside. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> we were, <coughs> then after a while we ran. <coughs> at Guam, we ran harder patrol, and that would mean uh, every night the Japanese would come over and raid it, and you'd have to go to a certain spot, and everybody would bring your guns to bear, you know, and it was done very good. And then we ran harder patrol, up and down. It was tedium to apathy, you know what I mean? That, that was it. And uh, the officers were up in the conning tower, you know, had rifles, they had to do something. So they saw a big tree. I got the pictures. And they started to fire at the big tree, and all of a sudden, four hands went on like this. So they saw general quarters, like there was another war going on. I mean, it was the funniest thing you ever saw in your life. We came alongside, and there was two Japanese on this tree that had been hollowed out. They had American money. This was now at Guam. And they had been in the Japanese ground forces and the Japanese Air Force. and. Uh, tree was hollowed out. They had water, food, American money, watches. They were on their way back to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> and we took them aboard. We took them aboard. And, uh, and then, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. Anyway, we took them aboard, and then the, and the crew guys used to go up there, light a piece of paper and they drop it and they say, Tokyo! <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then we transferred them, the Marines came out, because uh, I know those, uh, those days I was a chief radio man, and I sent a message and what am I going to do? What are we going to do with it? I mean, that was a the message they told me to send. They said, hold them overnight, we'll send somebody out in the morning for them. So they did do that. <laughs> and I got the pictures to prove it, the smallest little guy you ever saw in your life, but they had <laughs> they were going back to Japan. Yeah, they were real yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that is funny. Yeah. Um, where, where were you when the bomb was dropped? Oh, no, no. I was back in the States. Back in the States. I but I mean, that's what I mean. What were you doing, and what did you think when you first oh, heard I about it? Well, I was tickled to death. Uh, the war would, would have been over. Now, I don't know if I would. Because I got transferred to Ulithi back to the States to go to advanced radar school at, at uh, Dearborn, Michigan. And I remember if I was on my way or whether I was already there. Oh, no, it had a, no, because I got married and my wife went with me to, no, no, the, the war was still on, you know, because I went to Portland, got married, and then had a 30-day leave and then had a report to Dearborn, Michigan, you know, so. But, but you felt that that saved a lot of... Oh, yes. No question about it. And in fact, you know, this is all second or third and fourth hand information. They formed what they called the American, the American Division. And the Marines were supposed to go in at one end of the island of Japan and the, the American Division, which was a, which was a con uh, conglomeration of all the army units that were already there, but the Marines, you know, they went in dead ahead, then they spread out, and they lost a lot of lives. The American, the Army had it just the opposite. They bombed and bombed and bombed, and uh, then they sent them in. But the, the Marines, you know, yeah. for them, you know how they operate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, so it saved a lot of lives, yeah. a lot, a lot of lives. So uh, when did you get out of service then? Uh, I got out in 19... Forty? Uh, no, wait, 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 I was at radio school and... Uh, Did you go back to Chicago then? Uh, I went back to Chicago and went to work for the mill, same mill that I've always been with. And, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, did you, how, 
you're still working, you say, but uh, well, so uh, how long did you live in Chicago all this time? Well, I was born and raised in Chicago, and, and, and from 40, when I got discharged from 45 or 46, 45. But I traveled, I traveled pretty near most of the western part of the country for them. Mm -hmm. And then, in, and I used to spend a week out of in, in Minneapolis alone because it was, I, I told you, I sold te textiles. At that time, Minneapolis was the center of the heavy outerwear coats produced in this country, and I used to spend a week out of every month up there. And then they finally said to me, listen, first of all, I didn't want to travel so much. I had kids. You know, I used to be gone for a lot of time. I used to see my in-laws who lived in Portland more than my wife saw them. Um, I wanted to get away from traveling so much, so I jumped to the chance to move, to, and I moved up in 51. And, uh, to Minneapolis? To Minneapolis, and I've been there ever since. And it's okay. been, it was a good move. It's a wonderful place to raise kids. Yeah. It's a nice community. And when did you start coming here to the desert? Well, I had an operation in 65 or 66. I probably took a week or 10 days and came down here then. And it's been a love affair ever since, and it's gotten longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> And now it's three months, and uh, uh -huh. but tell you the truth, fellas, the stock market isn't doing me too good right now, <laughs> and I may not be back again because I can't afford it. Uh, do you do you own a place here? No, I don't own a place. Been running, been running a place for years. Same place, on Same. Well, pretty much. Till they sell it, and then I gotta find another place. And where where right now are you staying? It's at the uh, fairways, right on Ramon. You know, you know where the public golf course is. Mm -hmm. Right across the street. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been there for for years. And um, you were married for forty nine. Forty nine years and two days. And did your wife pass away then? Passed away of cancer. Oh. And then uh, two two years later, I remarried to a girl, wonderful girl. And, and what, uh, what is her name? She got three boys, and, and we're a blended family. Yeah. What, what what's your President wife's name? Shirley. It was her friend, Shirley Rifkin. She has uh, three sons. One of them is a film editor in Hollywood. He, he's done a lot of pictures. Uh, the last picture he did was Ali. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. He turned down two wonderful films. He turned down My Fat Greek Wedding, and he turned down uh, Chicago. Oh, man. <laughs> well, it was made up in Toronto, and he didn't want to go back. To, he didn't want to go up to a cold country. <laughs> And, but he's working now on a film called uh, Pirates of the Caribbean for Disney, so uh, oh, it isn't any. Uh -huh. And then the other son is a, a music uh, uh, arranger and, and lives in Nashville. And the son that lives in Minneapolis was for 10 years the drummer with Prince. And now he owns his own recording studio. So we got, and, and, you know, seven or eight grandchildren from there, and I've got two. But we're a very blended family, thank God. That's yeah, good. Yeah. And um, what do you do for recreation? I see you've just joined the, become a volunteer at the Air Museum, where you'll be in the Pacific hangar telling oh, yeah, folks absolutely. about everything. Well, that. what do I do now? You know, uh, well, you know, I, I was 80 years old, and I was still running 10Ks. And my proudest moment was I would run with my granddaughter the 10 Ks, but she runs at 26. <laughs> but she she would she would run with me. But then I had a knee operation. I blew a knee, and I had a back operation. So I'm now uh, spends two to three days in the gym, a couple to three days in the golf course. But you know, I managed to get around it all. I think you're doing just great. Um, maybe at this time we've got about 10 minutes here where we could have some questions and answers. If anyone would like to, uh, to answer, I'd ask you to go up and sit down next to uh, Dick here. Uh, anyone have anything they would like to uh, ask him? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, we are going to go downstairs in the Pacific hangar, and so if you want to hang around down in that area, um, he's going to tell us, show us about the ship and everything, and uh, and he'll probably be happy to chat with you at that time. Okay, Harry, did you have uh, anything you wanted to ask? Yeah. 
Have you ever been back to any of the uh, reunions in Australia where they celebrate the Battle of Gold no. Creek? No. Are no. you aware of those reunions? Uh, Tell you the truth, no. This is the first time I've heard of it. You need to chat with uh, Alexander. Is that his name? Uh, uh, Ander Anderson? Vincent Anderson. Vincent Anderson. Because yeah. uh, he took a group back. Oh, in May. In fact, I just sent an airmail today to a group from and it's something to do with it's a midway group somebody told me about a you know which one I'm talking about uh, no uh, I just sent a somebody here on oh, O'Brien I can't remember the name of O'Brien told me about it so mm -hmm. he gave me the email yeah. uh, and, you know. so apparently it's uh, they celebrate the Battle of the Coral Sea like Oh, I don't, listen, I would, yeah. listen, I'm 85, I don't think I want to be making a trip to Australia anymore. Yeah, you know, from what he said, uh, they take care of everything. You know, they, uh, he went with 10, 10 people back a year ago. Is that right? Yeah, they no. were all Coral Sea survivors off the Lexington. Yeah, oh, well, that's a different story. Yeah. No, no, they may not like you being on the door. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> Okay. Do you remember the CO's name of the Lexington at the time? No. 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 In fact, I wish I could remember them. Maybe somebody here would know about it. We have the log of the Lexington in the library. You have a so log of the Yorktown? Not the Yorktown, but we have the Lexington. So we had a we had an executive officer who was exceedingly popular. He used to show him the chow lines and jeans and all that kind of stuff. You never knew, you know, they never knew who he would, exactly who, oh. if he would show up. <laughs> and then, of course, he became a full captain, and he was on one of the later aircraft carriers. I, 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 if I heard the guy's name, I'd know it in a minute, because he was really wonderful. And the, the man, I mean, they loved the Buckmaster because he was, right. he, he minded his own business, and. He saw to it that the enlisted men were taken care of, but this guy was an exceptional officer, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. yeah. But we can, we've got some literature and stuff in the library we might be able to tell. And I that think he would, well, I, I, but he might have been killed in an airplane crash. Now, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. Okay. Dick? Yep. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure, okay, believe we'll, me. Um, uh, let me get you unhooked there, and we'll go downstairs okay. here in a little bit. This is my kids will get a big kick out of this. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and my grandchildren? What that granddaughter that you run with? What's her name? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, 85, and you're, you're not so quick anymore. Uh, Allison. Allison. And yeah. how old is she? She's about 25, 26. Yeah. She's married. She lives in New York, yeah. and uh, she and she runs. You know, the Boston and the New York. My, you know, yeah, it's yeah. just terrific. It takes her about three, four hours, but I got to give her credit. She starts and she finishes. When did you start running, seriously? After I had the operation in 65 or 66. And uh, so I've been running that long until, you know, until 1980. Okay, okay I'm going to shut her down here okay. right now. So south of Pearl, where you were down in like the Fiji Islands uh, when you first were dropped well, those Marines off. No, we first, let me, you know, I gotta. <laughs> no, we first went. To yeah, you gotta push that little. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just do this, but it's, you gotta. It's a little hard. You, you gotta pick it up with your eye first, so you can see where it is. Okay, you're 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 way over there. There you are. Now now, oh. I'll put it on Pearl. Here, here. And then we came on to Pearl. And as I said before, we came in and dressed whites, lined up in formation, because that's the way the captain wanted it to be. Yeah. And it was, this has got to be a minimum of three weeks later, and it was still mm. dev a devastating sight to see. Many, yeah. As I said before, many of us cried. And I think that originally it was just to make the papers in the States to make the people really feel good that we were doing something. Right. But. The NUE talk, I mean, the uh, uh, Enterprise was with us, mm -hmm. and uh, they were hit, as I remember correctly, and they went on back, and we went on down to, uh, I don't see it here at, at the... Pearl, 
Uh, to Tonga Dabu in the Tonga group. Yeah, it's probably not on the map. Probably, and I don't see it on the map. Let, okay. Let's come up here a little bit closer. Yeah. We're going to be down in this area here a little bit. Yeah. Was it near? Did you have an idea that you were going to get involved in a, a big battle pretty soon? No. Or did it just come? No. Uh, MacArthur was here. Mm -hmm. That's it. And mm -hmm. Salamo, I don't see that's on there. Yeah. And uh, the, the old Stanley Range is right here. Mm -hmm. And people used to fly over the old Stanley Range to do the bombing. Right. And the Coral Sea, the Battle of the Coral Sea was right, was right out here. Yeah. And uh, that's where the Lexington was hit and was on fire for hours. And the doctor had got, it was unbelievable. You know, we figured. Let's get out of here. I kept saying, well, I hope we can get out of here because that Japanese, you got to know we're here because it was, you can see the thing, I would imagine, for 50 miles. Right. But they got everybody off of the Lex, and then they sent in our own destroyers, and they sunk the, uh, our own destroyers sunk the Lexington. And, uh, can we go by? Oh, yeah, go ahead, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, so you went back up to Pearl, like I can see. Then we went back up to Pearl. Well, to, to get uh, repairs in, in preparation yeah. for Midway. Yeah. Yeah. We went back up there, and then we and then we got we got patched up. Uh huh. And uh, the rest is history. The Battle of uh, Midway. Yeah. So you were okay. Midway is up there. Can yeah. you flash your deal yeah. up there now? But where you guys were was uh, a bit south of there. Yeah, we were to the south end. The other carriers were up in here. Okay. And we and we were the backup, and we were down. Because you went out a couple of days after they did. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was a couple of days, but it was later. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they were still working on us. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. And then uh, when you came back out on that to repair that uh, minesweeper, then you were over. Well, over the what? minesweeper, we came into Pearl, and then from Pearl we went to Any Week Talk and Quiet.